Hello, everyone, and welcome back to what has now been officially turned into regular webinars from IBM Research. I'm Katya Moskovic, the editorial lead here, and we are streaming live from IBM Research in Zurich, Switzerland. Totally thrilled to have all of you here tonight joining us. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Feel free to send us your questions during the show through the YouTube chat and we will answer them as uh, we will answer as many of them as we can. We've got a brilliant team of scientists here with us behind the scenes and they will answer the questions in real time. So if there is anything you ever wanted to know about artificial intelligence or quantum computing or anything else but were afraid to ask, here is your chance. And of course, we'll also aim to answer your questions during the discussion as well. As usual, next to me, you see a full-size model of a quantum computer. But today, we're not going to be talking so much about quantum, although we will talk about quantum as well, but we'll mostly talk about artificial intelligence and also what happens when you combine the processing power of a quantum computer in the future, of course, with artificial intelligence and so-called uh, typical normal classical high-performance uh, computers. More specifically, we'll talk about how AI, hybrid cloud, classical computing, and of course, quantum computing are bound to completely change the world in terms of accelerating the rate of, di of discovery of new materials and propel us into the future, of course. Joining me here today from our super cool robotic AI lab here in Zurich is IBM fellow and vice president for Europe and Africa, Alessandro Curioni who can tell you much more about how exactly our scientists are supercharging material discovery. Alessandro, hello. So please tell us, first of all, where you are and also, well, how, uh, you know, the discovery of new materials uh, has been traditionally done for centuries and what's actually changing now with AI, high performance computers and very soon quantum. Good day, everybody. So I am here in the IBM Zurich Research Lab, especially in, specifically in the lab where we do have our AI-driven chemical robot. And uh, look, uh, we, we are speaking about materials and materials discovery. Materials are, can be really the holy grail to solve most of the problems that we do have in our society. Think about energy. New materials can help us to have much better and more sustainable batteries. Or eventually, think about climate change. New materials can help us to capture better CO2 from the atmosphere and try to solve the problem. Or maybe food shortages. Design of new materials can help us to have better fertilizer and helping to solve the problem. Finally, Think about uh, healthcare, right? Discovery of new molecules and drugs can help us uh, to tackle and try to solve problems like the pandemic we are in today. And by the way, what we are trying to do in IBM research today is exactly to accelerate uh, the full discovery process uh, of materials. Yeah, I mean, that's that's really great. Indeed, we do need to accelerate uh, how we discover new materials for to, to address all these challenges, because, you know, for centuries, as far as I know, anyway, we've been relying on serendipity, this magnificent word I like very much, uh, to discover new materials, because, you know, that's how Teflon uh, was discovered and uh, Velcro and Vaseline and plastic and so on. Even graphene, I'm sure many of our viewers remember when was it in 2010, I think, uh, that uh, you know, two scientists received the Nobel Prize in physics for uh, the discovery of this amazing material, the thinnest and strongest uh, material known. And it, um, you know, how it happened, I remember, I think they just kind of found a discarded ball of um, scotch tape in the wastebasket, and then like one of them just pulled it apart and there were uh, uh, graphite uh, flakes there and, he looked at them through the microscope and that was that was graphene, like one atom thick material. So that's a quite a happy accident, isn't it, Alessandra? Yes, indeed. And, uh, you know, that uh, is still true today. But, you know, that is the way we have discovered new material, you know, since the 
uh, human species exist, right? Mainly basic uh, by trial and error, okay? And these trial and error methods that they evolved and became what is called the scientific method has been the base, uh, you know, of all the discovery that we have done. So think about, for example, when uh, several thousand years ago, the Greeks, right, discovered first uh, concrete, right? Was uh, simply by chance uh, mixing limestone, clays, and water that they found that a new material with a very, very interesting properties was uh, created. And then from there, right, uh, we moved forward. We started to know more about things works. And so we went from a trial and error to a more guided trial and error methods uh, in which, you know, the theory and the knowledge helped a lot. And uh, later on, we started to have computers that allow us uh, to simulate materials and things. And, you know, all these things together helped uh, to accelerate the way we discover new material, but still basing on these very, very time consuming uh, trial and error test, uh, trial again uh, method that is a scientific method. Yeah, I mean, uh, seriously, it sounds super slow, super boring, like too slow to, to quickly deal with all the global challenges we've got today, right? And. So we, we really do need to be able to discover these materials a little bit faster, right? Yes, uh, correct. Uh, and uh, look, uh, uh, accelerating uh, here the discovery is uh, key. And by the way, uh, as I was telling, right, uh, even uh, using uh, simulation and computers uh, help, you know, to do the step better, but it doesn't solve and didn't solve the full problems. Why? Think about you want to, to uh, design a new plastic, right? Uh, you would like to have uh, something uh, that is uh, strong enough, uh, flexible enough, and eventually to be sustainable that after a while, you know, decompose uh, and uh, biodegrade itself. So you start uh, with these uh, characteristics and then you have to start to choose which are the monomers, so the molecules that when you put together, they form the plastic. Think about how many different organic molecules you can have, how many combinations you can have of all these things, right? If you simply go trial and error, even if it's guided, it takes, uh, it takes really forever, okay? And, uh, and um, that is a major reason why the process uh, is slow. It's a series of very slow linear tests that require a lot of experiment, a lot of feedback, and eventually only one of these, uh, of these uh, iterations uh, at a certain point uh, brings to a material that uh, has the property that you want. Yeah, it sounds really tedious and I would assume also takes, uh, you know, well, not only a lot of time, but probably also a lot of money, right? So how can AI, and in the future quantum, but we'll get to it later, right now, how can AI help and maybe already starting to help? So look, uh, AI indeed uh, can help uh, immensely, right? Uh, in many, many, many different ways. And uh, we in IBM started to use and implement AI methods that allow to accelerate the different step of the discovery process, right? So to bring, you know, something that was very linear to, to something that is more holistic, circular, and shrink, you know, the amount of time and also the investment, the amount of investment that we need to put in to design a new material. So, so uh, what, what would be then the new process? So you mentioned that the, the traditional process was quite linear. So now what is it going to be? Is it going to be circular or something? Like, can you talk about the new material, new methods a, a little bit more? Yes. Uh, look, uh, again, going back to the things of the, of the plastic, right? So what we were saying before, uh, one of the major problems that you do have, that once you define the characteristic and uh, as I told you, you want to translate this uh, to a given material with uh, desired properties, uh, you start uh, using uh, the knowledge that you have uh, and you start uh, eventually putting together the molecules that you do believe uh, that, are, uh, that are most uh, plausible, right? And uh, doing this, uh, you repeat uh, eventually maybe a lot of work that was done already before, uh, simply because you don't know it. You are not able to 
integrate eventually the knowledge around these materials and processes that is already existing. So one first thing that we have developed is a method that we call deep search that is able to read automatically technical document papers, the patents, and extract the knowledge and the information related to these materials so that we don't start from a tabula rasa, from scratch, but we start from a point that includes all the knowledge around these materials that is known up to a certain point, okay? So once we have done this step, you know, you don't repeat a lot of the, the thing that is already known, but you start in a much more advanced way. And then eventually you can use simulation, including also quantum, to help to close the gap that you have in the knowledge. And once you have done this step, you can use a new generation of uh, AI models that are currently uh, called generative models that on the base of this knowledge uh, help you to find out uh, and create hypotheses of uh, materials, uh, monomers, materials, and processes, uh, right, that could give the property that you want. So you accelerate uh, the bringing the knowledge together and you accelerate the process uh, to create uh, new ideas. Wow, okay, so it sounds to me like, let me just uh, sum it up a little bit so that I understand. So actually it does sound quite circular, right? So like we are closing a loop in a way. So we are starting with a question, we want to design a new material or something and then we formulate a hypo hypothesis and then we use this deep search technique you described, AI assisted technique to kind of find out what's already been published in the literature, right? Or, uh, exactly on, on, on this material that we are kind of looking for with these properties. And then we use AI again to actually, you know, design those molecules based on those properties we've just outlined. And that's another AI, but again, AI assisted step, right? In this, in this loop. So we are kind of using AI throughout and then we're going to be designing those molecules uh, later based on that digital design. We're going to be developing them as well. So that sounds like a pretty cool circular way of uh, compared to the linear, what we had before, right? Yes, definitely. And by the way, once you have this uh, uh, new set of uh, new molecules, uh, hypothetical virtual new model molecules that you have, right? You can use uh, eventually again simulations, right? To test some, if that, some of the hypotheses that you had were right. And eventually you can reduce uh, the number of molecules uh, that, uh, and processes that you need to test. And then eventually, you know, it's not finished there because you can, in, at this stage, have still a lot of virtual materials, molecules, or eventually processes, right? That you do think that are good, but you don't know if they are good. So you still still to do a lot of testing. And the very interesting thing is that AI is helping us also to accelerate this testing using these AI robotic tools that we do have here. We take the virtual molecules and automatically we create the procedure and the steps and the chemical reaction that need, we need to do to create the materials. We synthesize the material with this uh, uh, robot and we test the materials all automatically. So that is closing the loop. Yeah, I mean, um, I remember actually reading somewhere that the re one of the reasons why it's so difficult to design materials, like has been so difficult traditionally, is because there are so many molecular configurations, right? Like I'm sure our our viewers now all had, you know, uh, high school chemistry and, and and remember, like if you put a molecule together, you have all these different atoms. Uh, and, and apparently, apparently the way to put all these atoms together in a complex molecule, there are more of these configurations than there are atoms in the universe or something like that. Am I am I kind of being on track here, Alessandro? Yeah, look, uh, I think that uh, is a little bit more complex on that. So it's even worse, right? Because you have also different way yeah, to bring the molecules together and make a reaction to create at the end larger molecules that eventually evolve to become a real material with the property that uh, you want, right? It is even more complex. And that is why AI allow us uh, to come up and find all the right uh, or uh, the different uh, synthetic steps a chemical reaction that you need to do and then decide, help us uh, to decide which is the best for what we want to do 
with the initial materials that we have available. Mm -hmm. Actually, and um, just before we move on, I would love to and encourage you guys watching to send us your questions via, via the chat because we will be answering them in real time with Alessandro here as well. He would be more than happy to take on your questions. So please do send them both for uh, our team of experts and also for us here during the, the discussion so that you guys are you know, engaging. If, you're, if something is not clear, we'll be able to go over it again. But I think now is pretty much the time to kind of stop at, at, at this final step that you just said, Alessandro, about actually developing this, these molecules. So basically, first we went through this whole kind of literature, patented uh, literature and stuff, and pu published literature on a specific material. And we know the properties of this molecule that we want to, that we want to get. And then AI helps us to, to do the simulations. At the moment, we are doing the simulations with classical computers. And then we finally, we have these candidate materials that we would like to develop. And now, Alessandra, why don't you tell us what, what it is next to you, which looks so cool. I don't know if it looks like a fridge or whatever that is, uh, but you know, I think it's a robot. And how does it actually work? How can it help us develop new materials of the future? So this is our uh, robotic, uh, chemical robotic system that you see here, but it's only the final step of what uh, I told uh, uh, so far, right? Before uh, arriving to this robot, once we do have uh, the the we do have uh, you know the molecules, we have identified the molecules that we want to design. You know, we do have uh, an interface that you see there, where you can uh, write the molecule with chemical language. Okay, and uh, this uh, application that runs on the cloud. Uh, is able, starting from the molecules, again, to try and to decide which are the chemical synthetic steps you need to do in order to get to this molecule, as you can see here. But, uh, you know, it doesn't do only that. The thing that is doing it, uh, once you identify the step, uh, is also telling you which are, you know, the processes that you have to do why to to get to this reaction is like a little bit when you cook uh, food in the kitchen right you have the ingredients and then you have to know how to put together these ingredients the temperatures the time the solvents and so on and so forth and all this uh, is done automatically by this interface using ai and once uh, you know you have the recipe the recipe is sent from the cloud to this uh, robot that is here and you see some uh, of the hardware, and the robot automatically take uh, the initial molecules, mix them together, have the reaction, and then eventually do the second step, third step, and so on and so forth, up to when, at the end, eventually, you get uh, the molecules uh, that uh, you like uh, to have. And once you have it, uh, of course, uh, these molecules go directly, you know, to a series of apparatus uh, to really test uh, if uh, the molecules that you are synthesizing is the one that you wanted that has the property that you want. And by the way, all these uh, using AI. And uh, to make it even more interesting, you know, here you see the result of materials that we have uh, tried to synthesize uh, uh, a few days ago. But uh, the very interesting thing is that the same AI that uh, we are using to drive this uh, uh, robot is the AI that we are using to do translation between uh, English and German, for example. So same methods that, uh, you know, has a huge impact uh, in a very different domain. Wow, that's, uh, yeah, that's definitely really, really cool and, and impressive. And um, actually, I can see now people are starting to uh, ask uh, you questions, Alessandra. So, First question for you is, um, what molecules has IBM created with AI already? So that is a very good question. Look, uh, um, we have, of course, uh, put together the full procedure. But then, of course, we have also tested this procedure to really understand if uh, it could accelerate you know, the discovery process. Look, uh, new material usually require 10 years of research and around 100 million of dollars of investment, OK? And we were claiming, and we are claiming, that using all these things together, we can reduce to one year and eventually 
uh, 10 million or 1 million of investment. And we have tested that, and we have tested that, for example, trying to desynthesize new materials that are called photoacid generator. Uh, these are the type of material, material that are used in semiconductor technologies, okay, to design the circuits uh, on uh, uh, semiconductor that are used to, to create computers. And, you know, due to the fact that we need to shrink, shrink, shrink this technology to make it faster, right, this process becomes uh, very important. And we have been using a certain type of materials in the 70s, but now these materials... Uh, uh, while they have the right properties, are not uh, uh, sustainable from the environmental viewpoint. So we do need to get uh, new materials that have better sustainability. So we have used all these procedures to design, synthesize, and test and prove that, you know, we have found a new, more than one, uh, photoacid generation materials that will be, you know, eventually the engine for the semiconductor uh, industry of the future. But uh, we have also started to use it in other environments. I was mentioning at the beginning uh, climate change, right? And the need to find better materials to capture CO2 and eventually convert CO2. Just now we are speaking, we are presenting at the American Phys Physical Society meeting some results uh, of uh, preliminary work uh, in that direction. Yeah, that sounds amazing. I mean, uh, these are such huge problems that our world is facing, right? That you mentioned climate change and uh, sustainability, greener electronics, greener gadgets, because we all want our computers, our phones to be ever slimmer and more powerful. You know, already we have tiny iPhones that are effectively, you know, like computers, right? And we want them to be even slimmer than that. I, I don't know how much more slimmer we can go, but this uh, um, using AI to create better materials more sustainably, that's, I think it's just amazing. And it's super important for other challenges uh, as well. And speaking of the robot, actually, I do see there is another question uh, in the chat here. For you, Alessandro, how can people use the robot outside of IBM? So that is, a, is a, another very interesting question, right? What we are doing here, it is not only to accelerate the discovery of the material, but or new materials, but it's also to come up with procedures that make, you know, this full process of discovery accessible to, I would say, almost everybody, okay? So not only accessible to the big companies that they have a huge amount uh, of money to invest, but for example, accessible to SMEs. So the full software interface that I show you before is uh, accessible for to everybody on the web. And everybody can start to test and create these virtual models and eventually with the right request, uh, from everywhere the, the, the world, you could run, you know, your synthesis in this laboratory. And eventually, if you have a robot similar to this one in another place of the world, using the same interface, you can go get and run synthesis there. Okay, so you're telling me I can't just go to a shop and buy this fas fascinating robot and bring it to my house and create a new, I don't know, solar panel for my roof. You could go to not to a shop, but to a company in, uh, to buy these uh, robots but we don't have to. and then use our, our interface to design and synthesize uh, new materials. Yes. Right. But you are saying that we don't have to because thanks to the cloud, we can actually already use it, correct? So that's thanks even to the cloud. Right? Yes, definitely. Thanks to the cloud, you can use the interface. You can use all this engine, right, that is... Uh, in the, uh, artificial intelligence based uh, to do the design, to do the process, and then send this process to any robot, right, in the world that can do these things. That's amazing. I would assume it's probably going to be super useful for the developing world as well, right? Like you, they can just use it through the cloud and then uh, design their materials. It can, it can, as I was telling you before, you know, is a way also on the other uh, uh, to that help us to democratize the process of discovery, to make it easier and to make it uh, usable everywhere. And by the way, I was mentioning we, before, you know, this work that we have done uh, 
around the uh, uh, CO2 capture and, you know, the climate problems, uh, you know, um, the, the, this work uh, is done in IBM research uh, in uh, different labs, uh, but uh, is, uh, most of this work is done in our Almaden research lab. Uh, and they have done, you know, all the thinking and design of the molecule there. They have put on the interface uh, there on the West Coast, and the synthesis happened here, you know, in Zurich, uh, in another continent, uh, completely independent, and that is uh, the, the freedom and, uh, and also the flexibility that this type of uh, cloud-driven uh, uh, application gives to you. Yeah, no, that's 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 really cool, and I know there are also some researchers in Brazil as well doing some of the some of that work. So it's indeed uh, very very global, very quite amazing. But I can see that there is another question, a little bit more technical now. Uh, somebody is asking here: Can you elaborate how AI is used to synthesize molecules in the robot? So, as I was trying to tell you before. Uh, the major core of uh, artificial intelligence here is uh, this method that uh, is uh, that um, uh, this model, right? That uh, we have developed and we have taught to this model organic chemistry. So in practice, we had a set of organic chemistry reaction, right? So here, molecules that reacting create products, right? And we have used uh, this database uh, to teach to these AI models uh, how organic chemistry, chemistry work, okay? And by the way, as I was telling you before, this model is exactly or very similar to the models that we do use uh, to translate languages from one language to another language. It is like organic chemistry. You have uh, the reactants, right? is uh, one language and the product is another language, okay? So using this type of method, we have a model that once you put uh, a series of molecules here, is able to predict uh, and tell you also uh, how good, uh, accurate can be the prediction, right? Which could be the products, okay? So if you take these things and you invert it, right? And you try to look all the possible combination, then you come up, with a system that once you give a molecule, is able to tell you automatically which are the most probable or, or interesting step to go from two reactants to that molecules. And then you can iterate, right? And then you go back to the initial molecules that eventually you have available from the lab that you use to start the synthesis. Yeah, it uh, definitely uh, sounds like it, it's gonna be, um... Well, it is already much faster to to um, to create a material using the robot uh, rather than you know doing the, the traditional way of mixing. What was it? Uh, lime, uh, concrete. Uh, the way they did concrete that you lime, described. Lime, clay, and water. Yes. There we go. The exactly. <laughs> okay. Um, we have actually a very interesting question here in the chat for you. How will this affect the traditional school of synthetic chemistry, traditional jobs, the teaching of organic chemistry, and the research? What are the expectations? Maybe there would be more coding and less drawing. What do you think is the future now? No, look, uh, I do think that uh, as uh, all uh, the AI that we develop, right, um, we develop things that help uh, the professional, the chemist, to do their job better and faster. So uh, it is something that, uh, think about an organic chemistry, chemist, if what they had to do before, if they had the molecules was exactly using their knowledge and then try to see what was the most important parts and then eventually, you know, try it, uh, look what was the yield and, and all this step manually. Now, the same things uh, you put in the machine, the machine gives you all, the possibility to get there and then you right eh, organic chemist with your experience can look at all these things and then decide what is better you know is a way to augment and to facilitate and to accelerate the work of the chemist eh, is not something that is going to substitute the chemistry as a whole but it's going to accelerate a lot of the process and uh, you know having the human in the middle right eh, will be always eh, essentials 
okay, to connect the dots uh, at a higher level. Mm -hmm. But uh, definitely, it can be a use a very interesting and super useful instrument, uh, right? When you want to teach chemistry and organic chemistry in uh, eventually a more effective way. Hmm. Yeah, no, that's uh, definitely gonna, you know, gonna be quite quite a change, but in a positive way for sure. So another question here before we move on to kind of the second part of our um, discussion here, uh, if possible, how this technology will be used to create chemicals in medicine and healthcare? Again, you know, this uh, technology that I show here, and by the way is the first step of many different technologies along the same path right that one can create um, you know the basic the basic uh, um, innovation you can use it uh, you know to synthesize the new molecules and materials as i told you that will be used in batteries at the same way you can use it to synthesize to, to synthesize and eventually test uh, new molecules that uh, you can use uh, as a, a drug okay so we do believe that uh, this new way to do things uh, is going to impact the full, uh, I would say, uh, materials and chemistry based uh, fields and businesses. Yeah, indeed, because uh, you're right, uh, drugs, that's also, you know, materials. We, we call them differently, right? But it's exactly kind of the same chemical process when you need to create a new solar panel or you know, uh, protective shield for your spacecraft to go to Mars or, or whatever to protect it from radiation, or you need uh, a new drug uh, when you've got a pandemic going on like now, right? It's it's all, uh, and AI could be immensely, immensely helpful. But yes, um, you know what? So we, we, we so far we've been talking about AI quite a bit. So we mentioned deep search, we've mentioned uh, generative models, the predictive models, right? And of course, RoboRxN, this fantastic robot there. Uh, definitely some uh, great AI systems that could be of use for a uh, future of material design that is already starting to happen. But I'd like to go back to the part where, uh, Alessandro, you were talking about actually simulating the molecules, right? Because to simulate molecules right now, we have to rely on our traditional computers. So of course, we've got, you know, everybody is familiar with typical computers, we also have supercomputers like, you know, IBM Summit, but even the, as far as I understand, you know, even the most powerful supercomputers right now are not really able to help us that much with really, really, really complex molecules in terms of simulating, you know, potential new molecules. And that's one of the reasons why material design is, is so slow, right? Because, um, you know, I, I, I've heard that we've only been able to simulate on, on a, typical computer, a molecule that is like size of pentacene, which is like these five, you know, five, um, uh, what do you call them? Hexagons, right? Right next to one next to another. Uh, and anything that is more complex than that, and then the calculations just become super slow. So, and that's where these wonderful things come in, right? The quantum computers, very steampunk, I think. <laughs> Quite amazing. Um, and for that part of discussion, we now are going to be joined by our amazing quantum researcher colleague, uh, Pauline Olitro. I hope I'm pronouncing your last name correctly. Yes. Uh, you are quantum application researcher here at IBM Research. Could you tell us where you are right now and exactly how quantum computers can actually help us with simulating molecules in the future? Yes, so hi everyone. Uh, I'm here in a quantum lab at IBM. And indeed, quantum computers may help us simulate molecules that are currently out of reach with our traditional uh, computers. And this is because quantum computers operate with qubits, so the quantum equivalent of the traditional bits. And you can think of qubits as artificial atoms that behave just like the real atoms, but in a programmable way. So researchers are trying to engineer these qubits in order to build quantum computers. But let me give you an example to put this into perspective. So if you want to find the possible energies of a molecule, most of the time, what you have to do is to solve the many electron Schrodinger equation. 
And the thing is, the complexity of solving exactly this task scales exponentially with the number of electrons. So this means that even if you had a classical computer with as many transistors as there are atoms in the Milky Way, it still wouldn't be enough to exactly solve this task for even a simple compound like caffeine, or more interestingly, for um, the active site of an enzyme, for example. But now, if you have access to a quantum computer that has an exponential processing power by nature, then suddenly solving this kind of problems becomes a fair game. And the good news is that quantum computers today, they exist and they are available. But there's still a lot of work to be done in order to understand, uh, in order to build fault tolerant quantum computers, so error free quantum computers, as well as to understand how to best program these computers. And this is what the IBM uh, quantum team is working on. And in particular, in our group, we program quantum computers in order to efficiently simulate molecules and materials. And we not only try to uh, develop algorithms for fault tolerant quantum computers, but we also envision more near term approaches that can already be used uh, on the quantum computers that are available through the IBM cloud system. And you know, I think this is really a fundamental step in order to grow our understanding and to reach a quantum advantage as soon as possible. Wow. Okay. Yeah. That's that's quite uh, quite quite involved indeed. But uh, hopefully, we'll we'll get there quite uh, quite soon into that uh, fantastic future where quantum computers can can help. I wonder, Alessandro, if uh, maybe uh, you have uh, any questions for Pauline in terms of because you were discussing, you know, material design specifically. So uh... look, uh, we are for sure waiting to get a quantum computer with the size uh, that is big enough uh, to help us uh, to drastically accelerate what we are already doing today. Yeah, so be able to simulate these molecules uh, and these materials uh, with the right accuracy is vital for everything I have said before. But I have one question for Pauline. Pauline, look, uh, uh, if we jump a little bit in the future, right? In 2023, IBM will have uh, a quantum computer with... Uh, 1000 qubits okay and uh, uh, suppose that you will have a, access uh, to this machine and you will be the first to have access to this machine for 24 hours which molecule you are going to simulate so yes uh, in the ibm plans to have a quantum computer with over 1000 qubits by 2023 and uh, you know i think that's actually pretty impressive because when I joined IBM three years ago, the biggest quantum computer had less than 20 qubits. So you see the field is evolving very fast and that's super exciting. But um, you have to keep in mind that the number of qubits is not the full story. And this is because the quality of each single qubit as well as uh, the fidelity of the operations also play a key role here. And IBM, for this reason, IBM introduced a metric that is called the quantum volume and that takes this into account and gives a better estimate of the quality uh, of the performance of the devices. And so now if you start growing both the number of uh, qubits as well as the quantum volume, then we are going to be able to do uh, more interesting things. And um, we are going to be able to do for example, to implement error correction schemes. And so in this case, several physical qubits are going to be grouped together to form one logical qubit. And this logical qubit will operate error free. So you see the actual number of uh, qubits is going to decrease by one or two orders of magnitude. But at this point, we are going to um, get the benefits of fault tolerant quantum computing. So what I would do in the near term is to develop very efficient algorithms to well and apply them on small molecules at first, like the water molecule. And then in the long term, when 
you know, when fault-tolerant quantum computers will be available, then these same developments will open up unprecedented opportunities to simulate more complex systems. And um, I'm, I'm thinking, for example, of catalysts for the fixation and conversion of carbon dioxide to help reduce the greenhouse effect. Wow, Wonderful. that's... Uh... That's really cool, yeah. Um, I know what I would do, Alessandra. I was just thinking to myself when Pauline was was, uh, was answering what I would actually do with a quantum computer in 2023. Well, you know what? I think I would actually indeed design a material for spacecraft so that when there is like a solar storm, we're actually protected. Because you know what? Just uh, I think it was a couple of weeks ago, this Japanese guy has been asking on Twitter to apply to go to the moon, right? Around the moon, he's apparently going to select with Elon, Elon Musk seven people and he's paying for them to be on the spacecraft and to go around the moon. I was thinking to myself, okay, well, I'm going to apply, but what if there is like a solar flare from the sun and then poof, you know? So this is what I would do with a quantum computer, but that's just me. Anyway, moving on, questions to Pauline from the audience here. Can quantum computing help machine learning? Yes, so, um, you know, one of the big challenges in machine learning is to get the right data set on which to train your model. And so, in this regard, quantum computers can help, help to produce data. So, for example, quantum data or data that uh, you couldn't easily get from experiments. So, in this case, you can use quantum computers to produce this data. And another point is that quantum computers may be able to learn better from uh, quantum data or very complicated data. Great, okay. Um, speaking of data, actually, there's a question for Alessandro now exactly on that. What is the future of data science, Alessandro, in your opinion? What is the future of data science? Look, uh, data science is, uh, I would say, and data is uh, the starting of course, uh, of everything we are said. You don't have AI without data, okay? And uh, AI and what I show, we have shown to, to here, is uh, exactly the best possible way to, to extract value from data and uh, eventually make uh, uh, this, uh, this uh, extraction of value right uh, uh, useful. And uh, Another point here that uh, you can think is uh, AI is helping us uh, also to automate, uh, as I show you, right, uh, everything around uh, data science and uh, IT. So AI is not only helpful, you know, to extract uh, value from the data, but is also helpful to make everything you have to do easier to do that job, okay? Mm -hmm. So the future of data science, uh, to me, is uh, the future of AI. Wow, you, you really summed it up quite nicely. I, I love that. The future of data science is the science of AI. Um, Pauline, question for you. What types of algorithms can you run on, on a quantum computer for real world problems? So at the moment, we mainly run algorithms that are called variational. So um, we basically produce some quantum states that carry the information of your, of your problem. And we use this quantum state, it, it carries this information very efficiently, and so we use this quantum state to extract uh, some information. And yeah, so when we, once we have extracted this information, we give it back to a classical computer that does something with this information, and then exchange uh, more information with the quantum computer uh, until you reach the convergence of your algorithm. And I don't know, so a real world example would be, I'm thinking about um, solving the protein folding problem, which you know is a um, very fundamental problem at the heart of uh, drug, de drug design. And that is a very complicated optimization problem. And for these quantum computers, uh, well, may be able to, to do a good job. And actually, in our group, we did work on an algorithm to exactly try to tackle this, this task. Yeah. 
Okay, well, um, actually, and here's a question, um, a very interesting question that kind of brings me back to what um, our previous webinar was about, uh, in, in case uh, any of you guys watching uh, also watched uh, the one in February with Heike Ryle, when we talked about education and infrastructure and, you know, the future of quantum computing and how actually we can help the world to make it all a, a reality. And somebody is asking here, it's a question for Pauline, but I guess uh, we could all talk about it. Um, do you see a way to introduce quantum computers to an average curriculum for chemistry students? I guess, I mean, in, a, in my view, it wouldn't only be chemistry, but also, you know, physics, of course, and computer science. But just in general, uh, how early do you think we should kind of introduce quantum computing to pupils, even in high school? Or should it be only, you know, reserved to kind of university students? So what's your view, Alessandro? And then, Pauline, maybe you'll, you could also answer that. So look, uh, uh, indeed, uh, we are already doing this and we are already introducing this in the curricula, right? Uh, with many, many universities. And uh, moving forward, right? So all these uh, will become more uh, ubiquitous. And, uh, you know, it's a really, um, I would not say a transformation, but uh, it will be some sort of evolution, right? Of information theory to quantum information theory to quantum computing. And while we are doing everything to make things easier to use quantum computing integrated with classical computing, right? Understanding some of the basics will become uh, super important for any future evolution. And Pauline, what's your view? How early do you think we should? I mean, for you, actually, for your career, how did you get started? How did you start actually in quantum computing? And uh, do you think? If you were studying now or even 10 years from now, do you think it would have been beneficial to start, say, learning about quantum a little bit earlier? Yes, so um, I started with quantum computing pretty um, late, so during the course of my master's. And, you know, I think actually it helped me understand a lot about quantum mechanics. And I think the earlier you start, the better and we have tools that are now very graphical and that really help uh, help you understand what is quantum mechanics through uh, quantum computing and so you know i've met uh, students from high school that were participating to some um, uh, quantum information events and they were doing incredible things and so i think it would be it would be nice to already introduce quantum mechanical concepts um, in high school, and it, I think it would be easier using the tools that um, that we developed in the in the last years. Yeah, um, definitely. I mean, I I personally totally agree. I never had quantum computing. Uh, well, until actually I had quantum physics at university, but I wish I had it uh, back uh, in high school. It would have been uh, so much more fun for sure. Um, another question for Pauline here from the audience. How many people are using IBM quantum computers at the moment? So yes, at the moment, there are more than 300,000 users of um, the simulators and uh, quantum computers of IBM. And yeah, I, these users run in average over one day more than 1 billion circuit executions, both on simulators and um, quantum hardware. And you know, when I heard this number, I was actually very impressed. Um, and this has led to the publication of more than 400 research publications. So the community is pretty active, yes. Mm. And um, a question for Alessandro, actually. Um, Alessandro, what, what do you think? So how, how do you see it in the future? I mean. You know, we've been talking a lot about AI separately, quantum computing separately, you know, cloud is obviously, you know, everybody's using cloud right now. But in the future, I would see even like in the near future, right, as soon as we get uh, quantum computers to be fault tolerant, shouldn't we be like kind of bringing all of that technology together, even for material design, but also, you know, some other problems as well, just kind of to get all that infrastructure working together. What do you think? No, it's not we should. That is what uh, we will do and we are already doing now. 
because you know you go back to what we were saying before quantum computing will be super useful to accelerate uh, certain type of uh, application and workloads right will not be for everything and uh, and will be super important to make sure that quantum computing work with classical computing and that, that eventually you know ai and also not only all the new methods that i i i described before but you know also a uh, new method to accelerate ai are going to come together you know from a system viewpoint and it's exactly the synergies of all this technology that will allow us uh, you know to really over boost uh, supercharge uh, the scientific method uh, and do what uh, uh, i told you at scale and uh, but there is one very important thing uh, that uh, uh, you know connect all these things is also the way we make uh, these computing resources available right cloud hybrid cloud will be the delivery model that will allow all these things uh, to be accessible also in an easy way in a flexible way everywhere mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and so um how, how can people actually start using quantum computers today maybe you guys can walk us uh, through this a little bit um maybe pauline you could mention specifically because you're in this funky fantastic quantum lab how can somebody sitting right now at home or maybe at a university start using ibm quantum computer tonight or today wherever you are in the world so the first step would actually to be to go on the um, ibm quantum website and there create an account and there on this website you can do different things you can access a quantum composer that is a very nice graphical interface where you can start uh, building quantum circuits. You can really just drag and drop the gates on the, the qubits. So it's very easy to use. And then you can just execute your circuit either on the quantum machine or on the simulator. Then when you get a little bit more advanced, you can go to the part of the website that is called the quantum lab. And there you can learn about Qiskit. Uh, there is a textbook. There is um, a lot of tutorials. And the nice thing is that you can put in practice everything you learn directly in some Jupyter notebooks that are pre uh, prepared for you and that are very just easy to use. Um, yeah, and also on the um, this uh, IBM Quantum website, there is a page where you can find all the information about the devices. Um, so it's very instructive because you can see the architecture of the devices, you can see the properties, so like the coherence time, uh, gate fidelity, uh, everything you need to know about them. Mm -hmm. And kind of picking up on that, we've got a question here. Uh, but I, I suppose the, you guys already gave the, the uh, answer to that question. Can students in Africa access IBM's quantum computer? I, I think I can even answer that. Of course you can, as long as you have access to the cloud, just do what Pauline just described. And wherever you are, I suppose, even if you're in Antarctica, where I personally would love to go, you can access IBM's quantum computers. Now, a question from Alessandro here. How can someone get a job at the IBM lab? Ooh, that's an interesting one. Sorry? How can somebody get a job at IBM Lab? <laughs> okay, look uh, simply, look at our web page, uh, www.research.ibm.com, and uh, there you see all the opening, send uh, and uh, follow up from there, or eventually send uh, your CV and an email to, to us. So, relatively easy. Fantastic. Well, I think we just have a few minutes left, uh, so I don't know if there's going to be any last uh, questions uh, coming in uh, for us. Uh, if not, uh, then uh, Alessandro, I would like to ask you uh, my last question. What would what material would you like to design on a quantum computer, say, five or ten years from now? What would you do? I would say that we can start to design this now, and to me, you know, would be to try to find uh, a better catalyst, as I told you before, to do nitrogen fixation. That is the process that we do need to create uh, fertilizer, right? So that we can have, that is a, 
uh, doing it in a much better way that we can do today. What we are doing today, you know, use uh, a process that is more than 100 years old and use an enormous amount of energy. And I would like to redesign these, right, to have better fertilizers, to get uh, a more sustainable uh, food uh, growth. Fantastic. Um, I totally agree with you. That would be uh, amazing. And it's already uh, happening. So it's great that, you know, we're, we are doing this amazing research. I think we are pretty much out of time. So I would love to thank our speakers here tonight, of course. Thank you, Alessandro. Thank you, Pauline. Um, thank you to uh, the scientists behind the scenes there answering uh, questions in the chat. And uh, of course, thank you to everybody who joined us tonight. Uh, if you have any other questions or comments, you can always find me, Alessandra, Pauline on Twitter. We're all on Twitter. Uh, that would be the best way just to send us a DM or approach our comms team at IBM Research, who would be delighted to help you. If you are a reporter, also feel free to, to reach out and uh, we would be more than happy to answer any questions. And this video will, of course, stay on YouTube, so you can go back and learn um, as much as you want about AI, quantum computing, and cloud. Thank you very much, and goodbye.